Well, we're going to be in 1 Corinthians 14, if you want to turn there, and I'm going to pray for us before we dive in. Lord, we thank you so much. Lord, we thank you that you have called us out of darkness into the light. We thank you for the gift of your Holy Spirit. We thank you for the gift of salvation. We thank you for the gift of your word. We thank you for your redemption, that you have pulled each of us, Lord, who are on the path to death, and that you have given us life. Lord, we thank you that we don't have to be led astray by the tactics of the enemy, by the lust of the flesh. But Lord, we thank you that your spirit has revealed to us who you are, what you have done for us, that you call us into your likeness. And we pray this morning as we read your word that you use it, Father, to make us more like you that it doesn't fall on the old man, that it doesn't fall on deaf ears. But Lord, that as we open your word, that our hearts love your truth, that we apply it with all seriousness to our lives, that we trust it, that we're confident in you and what you have told us. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, 1 Corinthians 14, beginning in verse 1. Pursue love and desire spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. For he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God. For no one understands him. However, in the spirit, he speaks mysteries. But he who prophesies speaks edification and exhortation and comfort to men. He who speaks in a tongue edifies himself, but he who prophesies edifies the church. I wish you all spoke with tongues, but even more that you prophesied. For he who prophesies is greater than he who speaks with tongues, unless indeed he interprets that the church may receive edification. In verse 1, Paul said, pursue love and desire spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. In chapter 13, of course, Paul was focused on love, and he turns his attention now back to spiritual gifts in 14. Uh, Spiritual gifts are important, and they have their place, but they are not the primary thing we are to be concerned about. Paul, as he has been teaching us on spiritual gifts, is also giving us some warning about the gifts. Do not seek to find your identity, your self-worth, in your gifts or function. Do not overemphasize your gifts. Find your identity in the fact that you are born again, cleansed by the blood, a a spirit-filled member of the body of Christ. And in light of this identity, pursue a greater love of God and with God and pursue love and unity with the body of Christ. And with that motive, with that identity and purpose, desire spiritual gifts that you may have a greater impact. So we should be praying for God and his grace to use us, to strengthen us, and to use us to strengthen the faith of those he places around us. But our primary pursuit, he says, is pursue love. That's our primary aim. And desire spiritual gifts but especially that you may prophesy. For he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God. For no one understands him. However, in the spirit, he speaks mysteries. But he who prophesies speaks edification and exhortation and comfort to men. The Corinthian church seemed to overemphasize the gift of speaking in tongues, thinking of it perhaps as the gift of gifts. And Paul emphasizes the gift of prophecy. Prophecy, Paul says in verse 3, speaks words of edification, which means to build up. Edification is a construction term, like building a home. And it means to build someone up in Christ or in the likeness of Christ. And exhortation or encouragement or urging each other on and comfort to men. But he who speaks in tongues, verse 2 says, does not speak to men, but to God, for no one understands him. 
However, in the spirit, he speaks mysteries. The word tongue or tongues in the Greek simply refers to the physical tongue or languages depending on the context. In our passage this morning, it is clearly used as a reference to languages. Tongues is usually thought of as either the ability to be heard in a different language, like we saw in Acts 2, or a spiritual prayer language that is predominantly for the individual in their time alone with the Lord. It would seem the gift, the same gift, is really spoken of in both ways, and will even be both ways in this chapter. So verse 4 says, he who speaks in a tongue edifies himself, but he who prophesies edifies the church. Tongues is different than the rest of the gifts that Paul has talked about. All other gifts are for the edifying of the church or the building up of the church as a whole. Paul says tongues builds up the individual. Tongues uh, then is different because the rest are for the profit of all, where gifts, prim- the gift of tongues is primary for the purpose of building up an individual or a sign for those who are outside the body. Prophecy, on the other hand, he says here, edifies or builds up the church. Prophecy is perhaps the most fruitful gift. It is a divine word given at an appropriate time. Uh, As we talk about prophecy, I want to remind you that the canon of Scripture, or what we call the canon, is what we have here called the 66 books. The divine word of God, the canon is closed. There's no books being added, no modern-day prophets that have equal uh, stature. All everything uh, that we have within here, this is the divine revelation that has been given to us. And prophecy, as you'll say later, is subject to the Scriptures. It is not new divine truths, but perhaps it's better understood as those who know what to say by divine unction or divine guidance is the gift of prophecy. When the Spirit gives warning or when He gives encouragement, when He reveals secrets in our hearts or others, for the purpose of calling them closer to Christ. In verse 5, Paul said, I wish you all spoke with tongues, but even more that you prophesied. For he who prophesies is greater than he who speaks with tongues, unless indeed he interprets that the church may receive edification. Uh, As much as Paul is bringing the gift of tongues down to its proper place, he does not want us to dismiss it as a bad gift. He says, I wish you all spoke with tongues or languages, but even more that you prophesy. And the reason being is that the church may receive edification. This was something that Paul was consistently concerned about. uh, 2 Corinthians 11 tells us Paul had deep concern or anxiety for all the churches. Paul spent the majority of his life after his conversion building up the church strengthening the church. We're still reading things that the Spirit used him to write for us. He's still building up the church by the grace of God. And it makes me wonder for us, how, how, how concerned are you about building up the church? Most people, when you talk to them, have some form of anxiety, some form of things they worry about. Does this keep you up at night? How can I strengthen the body of Christ? How can I help build them up into his likeness? How can I help shape them into his image? I encourage you. This is something that is an important mindset that we understand that is so vital for us as a church is the church is a gift to itself to build each other up into Christ's likeness. And Paul desired their personal growth, but in their gathering time, in their church services or their meetings, he wanted them to be focused on ministering to one another. When you gather together, he's telling them it's not a time for you to come and edify yourself. When you get together with your brothers and sisters in Christ, you build them up. It's not a time to show off what gifts you have. It's not a time to make others feel inferior. As we gather, we should come with this, with this mindset. 
when I get there, how can I strengthen my brothers or sisters in Christ? As I hear them talking and sharing things, how does that teach me uh, what things I need to be praying for for them? And this is the mindset that we should be having in the body of Christ. Verse 6, now brethren, if I come to you speaking with tongues, what shall I profit you unless I speak to you either by revelation, by knowledge, by prophesying, or by teaching? Even things without life, whether the flute or harp, when they make a sound, unless they make a distinction in the sounds, how will it be known what is piped or played? For if the trumpet makes an uncertain sound, who will prepare for battle? So likewise, you, unless you utter by the tongue words easy to understand, how will it be known what is spoken? For you will be speaking into the air. There are, it may be, so many kinds of languages or different kinds of sounds in the world, and none of them is without significance. Therefore, if I do not know the meaning of the language, I shall be a foreigner to him who speaks, and he who speaks will be a foreigner to me. Even so, you, since you are zealous for spiritual gifts, let it be for the edification of the church that you seek to excel. Well, in the last verse, verse 12, being zealous for spiritual gifts, he says, let it be for the edification of the church that you seek to excel. It would seem clear uh, if we could have attended one of the church meetings in Corinth at this time, they would have what we would call today a Pentecostal feel to, to it. The church clearly had a big emphasis on spiritual gifts and specifically the gift of speaking in tongues. Paul does not tell them there is... Uh, no gifts. He doesn't tell them not to use the gifts, but teaches simply the purpose behind them and the correct mindset towards them and the proper use of them. Desire them for the building up of the church. Gifts are often desired, I think, when we look around because we want, uh, personally, we want power, preeminence, status, experience, or to excel beyond our peers. Paul calls us to be motivated by love that we may serve one another better, that we might minister more effectively, that we might help our brothers or sisters grow into the likeness of Christ. In Ephesians 4, Paul explains that's why we have been given the gifts and even leadership and things in the church is to be brought into the image and the likeness of Christ. And we see this is how the apostles used their gifts. Paul said, imitate me as I imitate Christ. And the problem with people in the church service speaking in a spiritual language or a prayer language is no one else can understand them. It's no different than if somebody stood up and started speaking Russian or some other language today. They may be wise, they may be saying great things, but there's nobody going to be encouraged unless somebody speaks Russian. And you can be blessed sometimes if another person comes in, they share from another country or somewhere, if there is someone to translate it for us into our language. But it will not build the body up unless someone with understanding can tell us what they're saying. If, if you have people speaking in all these different languages or tongues, it doesn't bring unity if there's no translation, no understanding. It is actually something that will breed separation. Tongues uh, spoken without understanding in Scripture is actually a consistent reminder of judgment. Remember the Tower of Babel when languages were first divided? Verse 11, Paul said, therefore, if I do not Know the meaning of the language, I shall be a foreigner to him who speaks. And he who speaks will be a foreigner to me. The ability to speak in another tongue may be a real spiritual gift, but it only builds up if it can be understood. So verse 13, he says, Therefore, let him who speaks in a tongue pray that he may interpret. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my understanding is unfruitful. What is the conclusion then? I will pray with the Spirit, and I will also pray with the understanding. I will sing with the Spirit, and I will also sing with the understanding. 
Otherwise, if you bless with the Spirit, how will he who occupies the place of the uninformed say amen? At your giving of thanks, since he does not understand what you say. For you indeed give thanks well, but the other is not edified. I thank my God I speak with tongues more than you all. Yet in the church I'd rather speak five words with my understanding that I may teach others also than 10,000 words in a tongue. Tongues as a prayer language, again, is a great gift. It edifies the individual. It brings them closer to the Lord. But in the church service, it has no place without an interpreter. In verse 18, Paul said, I thank my God I speak with tongues more than you all. There are churches today that believe you have to speak in tongues to be saved, or if you're saved, you will speak in tongues. The Bible does not teach that. In fact, chapter 12, Paul made it clear that all believers do not have the gift of tongues. Some people, uh, again, they over-glorify the gift. Paul shows us it's a spiritual gift, but it's the least of the spiritual gifts, as it only edifies one person, and that without understanding. Others teach, uh, the same with this gift of tongues, or certain gifts such as prophecy, tongues, and the healings that they ceased in the first century. But it's hard to accept that view in light of what Paul is teaching. There is no place in Scripture that I'm aware of that suggests certain spiritual gifts have ceased. Remember back in chapter 12, verse 11, Paul said, One and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as he wills. It's not up to you or me what gifts are prevalent or lacking in our own time or what gifts you or I have. They are given by one, they're given by God, and he may give them to whomever and whenever he pleases. They are manifestations of his grace, and it's important that we remember that 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 is uh, not something that we get say in, but something that God divinely gives, and so he can decide what gifts are common or uncommon. It may be common at one time and not common in another But God decides uh, the distribution of each of the gifts according to his will. Back in verse 18, though, in our chapter, Paul said, I thank my God I speak with tongues more than all of you. Paul had a multitude of gifts, as did each of the apostles, or perhaps all the gifts. And he was thankful for the ability to speak with tongues. And it sounds like it was a common part of his personal prayer life. But in the church... He said, I would rather speak five words with my understanding that I may teach others also than 10,000 words in a tongue. Well, Paul clearly believed in the gifts of tongues. He exercised the gift of tongues. But in the church, he says, he would rather speak five words with understanding than 10,000 words in a tongue. If someone this morning could come up and teach the entire service in Greek, it would be an impressive use of the gift of knowledge. And they probably would have some wonderful insights into the details that we might normally skip over. But as impressed as we may be by his ability to read and to speak in the Greek, and knowing that he might have great insights, if it's never brought into English, some of you might just get up and walk out a few minutes in. And the gift that was given to edify has actually become a tool that empties the seats instead of filling them, a tool that discourages or frustrates the body instead of a tool to build it up into the likeness of Christ. And it's the same with the gift of tongues. You might be able to speak in in other languages. You might even be able to speak in an angelic language. But without an interpreter, it will not edify the body. Five words spoken that could be understood is superior to an hour-long sermon in Greek or in any heavenly language that we cannot understand. You know, I was thinking about that with five words. What would you say? That's a short sermon, isn't it? I was also thinking there's probably some of you here that if I ever took his advice and just gave a five-word sermon, would probably be really happy that week. Uh, I imagine I get a few people that told me that's my favorite message that you've ever preached. Uh, But what would you say? Think about that for a minute. What would you say? Paul said, listen, there's five words. 
that could be more powerful than 10,000 words uttered in a tongue that's not understood. And I was thinking about this. I'm thinking, Lord, what, what would I say? What would Paul say? You know, imitate me as I imitate Christ. It's five words in the Greek. Six in our language, but it's five in the Greek. That's a powerful statement, isn't it? And that one section alone, though we could go throughout Scripture and find various different places we could turn, but that five words in understanding is more powerful than 10,000 without understanding. So moving along to verse 20, he says, Brethren, do not be children in understanding. However, in malice be babes, but in understanding be mature. In the law it is written, with men of other tongues and other lips, I will speak to this people. And yet for all that, they will not hear me, says the Lord. Therefore, tongues are for a sign, not to those who believe, but to unbelievers. But prophesying is not for unbelievers, but for those who believe. Therefore, if the whole church comes together in one place and all speak with tongues, and there come in those who are uninformed or unbelievers, will they not say that you are out of your mind? But if all prophesy and and an unbeliever or an uninformed person comes in, he is convinced by all, he is convicted by all. And thus the secrets of his heart are revealed, and so falling down on his face, he will worship God and report that God is truly among you. First, Paul calls us to maturity in verse 20. He says, brethren, do not be children in understanding. However, in malice be babes, but in understanding be mature. He is referencing Isaiah chapter 28 here. And he's comparing the nation uh, of Israel, in uh, Isaiah 28, uh, Isaiah is comparing the nation of Israel to infants just weaned from milk. The prophets he calls drunkards and unclean, the false prophets there in Israel. And the drunk prophets, they mock Isaiah's message as too simple. You just teach line upon line, precept upon precept. It is as if they're claiming, we're beyond you, Isaiah. But then a warning comes to them in Isaiah chapter 28, verse 11. He says, for with stammering lips and another tongue, he will speak to this people. To whom he said, this is the rest with which you may cause the weary to rest. And this is the refreshing. Yet they would not hear The Jewish people would not listen to the simple teaching of Isaiah. So Isaiah says, you will listen to the people speaking in another language when they come and take you captive. And this is a fulfillment of the warning given to Israel. They rebelled against God in Deuteronomy 28, verse 49. It says, the Lord will bring a nation against you from afar, from the end of the earth, as swift as the eagle flies, a nation whose language you will not understand. And Paul here, he's calling the Corinthian church to not be like children in their understanding. Innocent in sin, but an understanding of the word of God and of his truth, mature. And what we see in Israel in Isaiah 28 is that everyone, uh, is that when everyone around you is speaking a language you do not understand, it's not a sign of God's favor It's a sign of judgment. It again reminds us of Babel when God confused the languages. Was that favor or was that judgment? Do you remember Belshazzar, king of Babylon? He took the cups that Nebuchadnezzar uh, took from the temple in Jerusalem and he toasted to the gods of gold, silver, bronze, silver, wood, and iron, and stone. And there appeared a hand on the wall that wrote something that they couldn't read except for one person who was spiritually discerned, one that was spiritually gifted. He could interpret it, Daniel. But we see there that the writing on the wall, was it a sign of favor or a sign of judgment? Even in Acts 2, when the Spirit is poured out on the the nation of Israel, is rebuked for killing their Messiah. They're called to repentance. So do not be like Israel who listened to the drunk prophets and ignored the plain teaching of the Word of God. Do not be childish seeking the best seats in the synagogue or the praise of men, seeking to establish establish yourselves over each other. Be mature. Take hold of the mind of Christ. So verse 22, he says, Therefore tongues are for a sign, not to those who believe, but to unbelievers. 
Looking at tongues and its two uses, one being personal, is a gift to the believer that edifies himself or herself. But when it's spoken in a public place or in a church meeting, it echoes more of a reminder of God's judgment than his grace. And it serves as a sign to those who do not believe. Right? In Genesis 10, the languages were divided, and in turn, it divided the people. To Israel, it testified to the word of God spoken through the prophet Isaiah, spoken through the words of Moses in Deuteronomy. To Belshazzar, it served as a sign not to profane the God of Israel. And to those at Pentecost, it served as a sign of the need of the people to repent and turn to Christ. But prophesying, he says, is not for unbelievers, but for those who believe. Prophesying, again, being a divine word spoken in a way we can understand it, a word that is applicable to our life right where we are at. It is an edifying gift. In verse 23, he says, Therefore, if the whole church comes together in one place and all speak with tongues, and there come in those who are uninformed or unbelievers, will they not say that you are out of your mind? Some people, when they read this, find a contradiction between verses 21 and 23. I don't think there are any contradictions there. 21 uh, is talking about tongues as a sign for unbelievers outside the church. And verse 23 is the rebuke to disorderly use of the gift inside the church. And we still see this uh, actually quite commonly today. If someone uh, walks into a church where, where maybe people speak in tongues more frequently. You might hear somebody playing a guitar or a music band playing. Another guy with a mic that is trying to talk or share something that he would call a a prophecy or a divine word. And you might also have a whole room full of people praying or murmuring things in other languages or, or some imitation of it. And the poor person who walks into this church, who's never been to a church, who wanted to see what do these guys believe and what they're like, he's going to walk in and he's going to think, these guys are nuts. What is going on in here? This is massively disorderly. And I'm not making that up. I have been in church services like that. Uh, Some of you who come out of a more Pentecostal background, you have been in a church service exactly like what Paul is describing, and you can agree it's not edifying. It's not building up. It's unwelcoming to new believers, and it's not building up uh, new believers or seasoned believers, and and it's definitely unwelcoming to non-believers. But verse 24, he says, if all prophesy and an unbeliever, an uninformed person comes in, he is convinced by all, he is convicted by all. And thus the secrets of his heart are revealed, and so falling down on his face, he will worship God and report that God is truly among you. Notice what the gift of prophecy does. Let's add the things he gives us here to what he said earlier. Prophecy edifies, it encourages, it comforts, it convicts, it convinces, and it reveals the secrets of one's heart to themselves. It leads people to the place of falling down on their face and worshiping God. It will leave them in a place where they go out of the church and they report that God is truly among them. Again, prophecy is a divine word given at the Spirit's command. It is a divine word spoken in a way we can understand it, a word that is applicable to our life right where we are at. It reminds me of John 4 where Jesus is talking to the woman at the well. And after the woman is talking with Jesus, and he reveals some of the secrets of her heart or the the struggles she's going through, the woman said, come and see a man who told me all things that I ever did. She was convinced. She was convicted, and she went and told others. And so the gift of prophecy doesn't mean that somebody is foretelling the future, It can be often something where the word is given of a, 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 the spirit is burdening us to say something, is exposing to somebody else both their sin, their need for Christ, his righteousness. Go back and read John 4, and you will see the work of a prophet. 
of the prophet. And what is happening is the revealing of Christ to a sinner. And she leaves edified. She leaves going and telling others about what she had seen. In verse 26, it says, How is then, brethren, whenever you come together, each one of you has a psalm, has a teaching, has a tongue, has a revelation, has an interpretation, that all things be done for edification. If anyone speaks in a tongue, let there be two or at the most three, each in turn, and let one interpret. But if there is no interpreter, let him keep silent in the church and let him speak to himself and to God. Let two or three prophets speak and let the others judge. But if anything is revealed to another who sits by, let the first keep silent, for you can all prophesy one by one, that all may learn and all may be encouraged, and the spirit of the prophets are subject to the prophets. Verse 26 reveals one of the problems in the Corinthian church was the lack of structure. Everyone was talking over each other. Everyone wanted to have the great things to say. Remember back in Isaiah, how he was criticized for teaching line upon line, precept upon precept. The truth taught simply. Verse 26, Paul said, let all things be done for the building up of the body into the likeness of Christ. Done and for edification. And this is the heart of every church meeting, that we would be built up into the image or likeness of Christ. In verses 27 and 28, Paul gives direction for the gift of tongues in the church. He says, two to three at the most with one interpreter. If no one can interpret, then those with the gift should stay silent. Speaking in tongues is not gibberish. It is speaking in another language. 1 Corinthians 13, 1, Paul said, though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels. Tongues is not a random noise. It's intelligent speech. It is always a language of some kind, or it's a counterfeit. In verse 29, he says, Let two or three prophets speak, and let the others judge. But if anything is revealed to another who sits by, let the first keep silent. For you can all prophesy one by one, that all may learn, and all may be encouraged. Well, prophecy is to be tested. We should weigh what the people are saying to the, to the back to the things. Is it edifying? Is it encouraging? Is it comforting people? Is it convincing and convicting and revealing the secrets of our hearts to bring us into the likeness of Christ? The spirit of the prophets are subject to the prophets. Never trust someone who claims to be a prophet and disagrees with the divine word of God. Even if the Pope who claims to sit in Peter's chair, he's still subject to the prophets. And so are each of us accountable to the scriptures. I would be very careful to trust anyone who actually comes and tells you they are a prophet. In our time, those are usually men with big egos and sound a lot more like false prophets than real ones. Beware of any of them who are asking you for money, looking for men who are in women. It's a common sign of false prophets. They are desiring a covetous men who desire material gain. Look instead for men or women who are in love with Jesus, who are edifying or building up the body, who are pushing people into Christ-likeness. Look for people who resemble Christ and the apostles. But be careful of those who preach prosperity, who set their minds on material gain. Run away from those type of prophets. They are destructive prophets. Because the gift is never about the man. It's never about the individual. The gift is a manifestation or the revealing, the making known of God's grace for the building up of the body of Christ. It is given for the benefit of others. Verse 33, God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. Let your women keep silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak, but they are to be submissive, as the law also says. And if they want to learn something... Let them ask their own husbands at home, for it is shameful for a woman to speak in the church. This section is dealing with church order. It's not that women can never speak to men or they are not allowed to ever talk. If a couple has someone over for dinner, you know, the wife may engage in the conversation or the women, but in the church service, the woman should learn in silence, meaning she should not be the one teaching or giving prophecy. Uh, It's taught throughout Scripture that men are to lead and women are 
to submit. And God does not care about what is politically correct or in which time you live. He is not swayed by popular opinion. He tells us the best way to run a family. He tells us the best way to run a church or a country. And we must trust that his order is good. And it's a a reminder for each of us, the head of the church is not man. The head of the church is Christ. And so as good servants, we each need to be fruitful as possible in the role God has given us. But we don't want to be fighting over different roles. If you were created and you're a leg, don't be concerned that you're not an arm. If you're a hand, don't be jealous of the foot. And if you're a man, don't desire the position of the woman. If you're a woman, don't desire the position of the man. God made no mistakes when he made you. And none of us, most of all, should covet the position of Christ. Be joyful to submit under his headship, under his leadership. Verse 36, or did the word of God come originally from you, or was it only that it reached? If anyone thinks himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things which I write to you are the commandments of the Lord. But if anyone is ignorant, let him be ignorant. How arrogant it is for men to challenge God's headship or God's word. Takes us right back, of course, to the sins in Genesis 3. Our part as the body is not to critique God's system or change it for our culture or our preferences. Our job is to fall into rank, to submit and to follow Christ. In the church, Christ is the head. We have no freedom to change the order, nor do we have freedom to dismiss or change what the word clearly teaches. There are no new revelations that supersede the word of God. The prophets, he says, are subject to the prophets. Christ is the head of the church, and therefore his word has the preeminence, because he is the head. And you cannot reject the word without also rejecting his authority. So when somebody comes and says, listen, the word doesn't apply anymore, they're also saying, listen, Christ isn't in charge anymore. No, Christ is still in charge, and his word is still in full effect. And we must always trust confidently in it. Run away from those who claim a a divine word that disagrees with the word of God. If anyone thinks himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge the things which I write to you are commandments of the Lord. I love the way Paul puts this. Those who claim to be prophets, who would say that they are like the apostles, Some of them even that he mocks calling super apostles in 2 Corinthians. He says, first, let them prove it by their subjection to what the apostles or prophets already wrote. The things which I write to you are the commandments of the Lord. Do not weigh God's word in one hand and man's philosophy in the other. No church leader has the authority to overrule or change the scriptures. The church is subject to Christ to the apostles and to the prophets, meaning the Old and the New Testament. Therefore, brethren, desire earnestly to prophesy, he says, and do not forbid to speak with tongues. Let all things be done decently and in order. Well, we should not deny the use of the gifts, nor should we allow them to be exercised in a disorderly fashion. Verse 40 says, let all things be done decently and in order. Earlier, Paul said, God is not the author of confusion, but of peace or of harmony. Paul has been dealing with these spiritual gifts, but he's also been dealing with order in the church. He's been given direction on headship of God, Christ, man, woman, order of the gifts and the roles in the church, as he laid out earlier in 12 of the apostles, prophets, teachers, and the list continues. And an order of priority that we should love God that we should love each other and then desire spiritual gifts so that we may build each other up. And as we approach this new year, my question for you is how are your priorities organized? And is building up your brothers and sisters in Christ part of your plans? Is seeking God the first part of your plan? You know, we live in a time of many false prophets, many false teachers, false apostles. And by the grace of God, we've been given each other to build each other up, but we've also been given the word, and we've been given the gift of the Holy Spirit and the ability to pray. And listen, we need to be in the word every day. If you have not formed that habit, you need to form that habit. It is essential to to your soul growing strong, to growing to maturity. 
You have to be in the Word, be in it every morning, every night. You can join me. I start every year, three chapters in the old, one in the new. I start in Genesis 1, I start in Matthew 1. You go read through it in less than a year. Take the Word of God in. We need to study the truth if we want to be able to spot the lies. And we need to be in fellowship and laying our requests before the Lord and asking the Lord that His will be done in us. We must be committed to the body so that we are both strengthened and able to strengthen one another. We must learn to use our gifts, whatever they may be, to build each other up into the likeness of Christ. So be committed. Be committed as we get into 24. To a small group, to a prayer meeting, to serving. That we as the body of Christ may push each other into his likeness. That we may be an orderly church in love with God and committed to him and his truth and loving and unified with each other. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for our time in your word. We thank you, Lord, for your grace of bringing us into your family, your kingdom, your body. And I thank you, Lord, within your body that you have given us unity with each other and and gifts. Lord, grace that you have poured out on your church that we might minister to one another to push each other on to godliness, to holiness, Lord, to being more like you. Lord, I pray that as we enter this new year, Lord, that you would make each of us more like you. Lord, that we would walk in greater faith, greater confidence, greater seriousness. Lord, that we would stop living like carnal Christians or immature Christians, distracted by all the things of the world. But, Lord, that our eyes would be fixed on you, that we would run to you, that we would herald your truth, that we would build up your body, and that your will would be done in us. Lord, we pray for your soon return. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.